Thanks everybody for joining me today. Uh, my name is Matt Collins and I'm the CG supervisor for Turn 10. Uh, this talk today is art directing for 100 miles per hour. And this is really talking about the unique challenges that we have um, art directing for a title that moves so quickly. Um, we don't have a lot of performance bandwidth because we have to move at 100, sometimes even 200 miles an hour. So we have to be really focused on sort of the core art values and techniques um, for, uh, for how we manage our frame. Um, so a lot of the talk today is actually speaking to the core art principles and core values of art. Um, but because we don't have a lot of sort of bandwidth for fancy graphics effects and everything else, we really have to double down on um, art direction and those core techniques. So I'm gonna go ahead and start going through it. Uh, the first thing we're gonna show you is a video, a trailer for our game. Uh, it might be a little choppy. All the videos that we played today might be a little choppy. So just it, uh, enjoy their visual excellence, but know that they might stutter a little bit. So we'll go ahead and uh, fire that up. pretty game, which I am very proud of. It uh, came out a couple of years ago and we're doing even, even greater things now. So um, it's been a lot of fun to work on. So the overview today is gonna be, we're gonna do a brief history of Forza and talk about the unique challenges that we have uh, making a racing game um, and how we prioritize visual investments for those challenges. Um, that'll be the majority of the talk. Um, I have a few slides in here. This is originally a GDC talk that talks about how we manage our performance budgets and how we manage our, um, our content budgets. And um, that might be less interesting to you guys, I'm not sure. So I'll go through it relatively quickly, but if there's things you want to ask me about or dive deeper on, feel free to ask questions um, later in the talk. And then I'll talk about some of the pitfalls and key learnings, because there's always key learnings uh, after you develop a title um, that we've had, and then summarize the talk at the end. So let's jump right into it. Uh, yeah, so my name is Matt Collins. Uh, I spent four years at Plymouth State University, University studying illustration. I actually wanted to be a comic book artist. And right as I graduated, the um, industry, the comic book industry fell apart. Um, and so I had to scramble and figure out what I was gonna do after that. So I wound up going to uh, DigiPen. Um, I spent uh, two years at DigiPen. Um, and they gave me a very focused um, career or, or a focused uh, education around games. Um, and then I wound up um, as an intern at Nintendo and eventually getting hired there full time. I was at Nintendo for three years working on Wave Race 1080 Puzzle League um, and eventually moved on to Microsoft where I've been making Forza titles since Forza 1. Um, and I've been there ever since and I'm now the CG supervisor at Turn 10. So yeah, just talking a little bit about the history of Forza. Um, we've made seven titles in our main motorsport franchise. There's also four titles in our Horizon franchise, um, which is a part of our sister studio Playground. Um, they're over in the UK. So we've also worked with them to make a number of those titles. And we also have a mobile title, Forza Street. So a lot of years of Forza. 
So talking a bit about the challenges that we have, um, we run at 60 frames per second, which in itself is always a challenge. It just doesn't give you a lot of margin for error when you're rendering. Our cars move at over 200 miles per hour at some, in some cases, specifically the Bugatti Veyron, which has been the, the bane of my existence since that car came out. Um, we have photorealistic visuals, which is a difficult target to hit. It's also kind of a, a plus, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we have what long draw distances. So in some cases, we can see um, up to three miles from a, an area on the track from one end to the other. So that's uh, difficult to manage. And most of our tracks are covered in vegetation. So this makes it difficult. Um, that's hard. Vegetation is notoriously hard in performance. Um, so that's a challenge that we often face. Um, and also in terms of composition, our options are limited um, just because we are using real world environments. So next, I wanted to show you a video that sort of illustrates the main difference between our game and say something like a first person shooter like Halo. So what you can see here is if you look at the scene on the right, that's our game and the Bugatti Veyron moving through our longest straight in the game on Le Mans. And you can just see how quickly you move through the scene. So this puts a lot of pressure on the system. Where on the left, if you have something like Halo, where you know it's still obviously there's a lot of graphical beauty here, but you're moving through the scene at a different pace, um, which just creates different bottlenecks on the system. So um, oftentimes, uh, when we're moving through the scene like this, uh, we'll have problems where the textures drop out, the geo drops out, the whole world drops out. The system just has a hard time keeping up with how quickly and how rapidly we're throwing geometry and textures at it. So it's always been a challenge for us. And um, so we, what that leaves us is not a lot of performance. And I'll talk about that. So the perks of making a racing game, um, it's not all bad. It's a controlled experience. It's on rails. We generally know which direction that you're moving in. Um, we can run some of our, our off track modes at 30 miles per, at, uh, at 30 frames per second. Um, and the fact that our cars move over at over 200 miles an hour is kind of a boon at times. Um, they, it means that they can't, the user can't slow down and, and look at every minor detail. And it means that we can spend more time on the overall frame and less on the individual quality of an asset because um, we know that person is moving very quickly through, this, through the scene. And also photorealism, the nice thing about it is that it's a clear style choice. We know what we're trying to hit. Um, it's not ambiguous. A lot of people have a frame of reference when, when we're outsourcing, so that's helpful to us. <clears throat> so how do we prioritize visual investments at speed? And like I said, this goes back to a lot of the core art principles. Um, I like this quote here, the first principle of the art is not to rely on tricks of technique. Most swordsmen make too much of technique, sometimes making it their chief concern. Um, what we've seen is when you have a, the ability to use a lot of fancy graphics effects, it allows you to sort of get more lax about some of the core art principles, art values. Um, because we can't rely on those effects, we almost are exclusively on core art principles and values. Um, and so this provides us a razor focus. And we actually believe that um, these, because they're so core to art, that any game title or anyone that's making um, something, if they pay attention to these core principles, it just makes their work better. And oftentimes we forget that. We see that with students, we see that with um, professionals, that um, the computer gets the better of them and they rely too much on sort of the whiz bang stuff and not enough on those core fundamentals. So when I talk about the core fundamentals, which is mostly what I'll be talking about today, this is what I mean. I'm talking about composition, value, Palette, texture, shape, storytelling, cadence, and performance. And these are the topics that I'll be going over in further detail today. And something that you'll notice is what I tend to do is move from large to small. This is how you should build up anything like a painting or any art piece, really. Um, a lot of people will tend to get focused on texture too quickly without having settled the, these other core principles. Um, and so as I go through this talk, I'll kind of be moving through it um, from that big to, with big to small in mind. So starting, we'll talk about focusing on what matters. We spent a lot of time thinking about composition and iFlow um, just because we generally, again, you're on rails. We generally know where, where you're looking and what you're looking at. However, early on in our titles, um, we weren't very good at this because a lot of us were work, used to working on first person shooters or other titles. And we focused the majority of our attention around this area. 
Um, so we've put a lot of detail into our trackside objects, into our, um, into our buildings. Um, and what we found was it just didn't have a lot of bang for the buck. That just doesn't take much of the real estate. What we call it is the wedge, but this takes about 80% of the real estate of the screen. So it's critical that the read of this is the most important part of the whole scene. Um, the sky, the road, getting that right, um, that's everything. And you can let a lot of this stuff go because we know that this is taking up so much real estate in our scene and is really what the player is looking at. We spent so much time thinking about this that what we did was we developed a system where if you're familiar with the rule of thirds where compositionally you split your frame into three parts, um, we, we did that here. And then we mapped out where the intersection points of, of those thirds were and then we took it a step further. Um, and what we found was that uh, the focus of the viewer, the focus of the player tended to be in this sort of red diamond in the center. Um, and we even backed this up with, uh, we had connect eye tracking at the time. And we, we looked at a whole, uh, a whole group of players to see where were they generally looking and it tended to fall right in this area. So we know that when you're driving, this is the majority of where your focus is. So this caused us to prioritize our scene accordingly. Our P1, all the assets where we would spend the most amount of time, the most amount of polish, uh, bug fix, would all happen within this area. This would be our, our P2 area. This would be the area that we would fix things, but it would be less critical. And what we found with the P3 area was you could almost ignore it. Um, I was amazed at the bugs that we would have in this area that seemed glaring to me because I was used to staring at the screen that people wouldn't see at all. Whole objects dropping out, the world missing. Um, it's just when you're focused on an area, it's very difficult to look anywhere else. Um, and people were just not looking out there. So it really just shows you how much composition matters and really um, not spreading your efforts out like peanut butter. So we use this tool so much that we actually created an in-game overlay that allowed you to see where you were looking. Um, and we would have this on screen at all times so that as we're driving around, we can really see where is the focus, where is the player looking, um, and where do we need to focus on polishing our assets. The other thing that we noticed is that um, this focus did tend to shift depending on the context of the gameplay. So if you look at this area here, this is a user that's taking a difficult turn in the wet. And so as they're turning, their focus changes from being out in front of them to right at this corner. You naturally start to look down at the, at the corner that you're taking, your focus and your attention goes to that because you're in a high intense gameplay moment. This here is where you're straightening out and what we found is then your focus shifts. It goes from being at the corner to up and out towards the horizon. So I'll talk about this later, but knowing that we tended to put our big moments or our big areas of visual interest, in this case, having a really compelling sky um, out in front of you, because we know that's what you're looking at at that time. So talking about the, um, the corner, uh, what we did is if we know that you're looking at the corner at a particular time, that's where we'd spend a lot of our attention and focus in detail down on that corner. So then we would start to add things like storytelling elements, extra detail. We'd spend a lot of time and attention on that corner because we know that's where your attention is. And knowing that really helps us prioritize as we're directing our content throughout because we just don't have a lot of time to make content at the same level everywhere. So we really have to understand where the player is looking and focus our attention there. We like to think of this focus, uh, like a painting um, and how you would approach a painting. If you look at this, which I really love, um, this is a painting of a woman that uh, from by one of my favorite artists where all of the attention to detail is right around the face where your eye tends to focus anyway. The core principles of value and saturation and all that and palette is still really good around the scene there's nowhere near as much detail, which you might not even notice at first. As soon as you get away from the face, the detail just drops away because the artist wants you to focus here. And what we found is if you actually put detail everywhere, um, it confuses the player then, or it confuses the viewer, then they don't know where to look. So composition and attention to detail really matters. And especially not putting the detail everywhere in the painting is really critical. And for us, especially because we're also limited in time and the amount we can spend on each asset. So next I wanna talk about the frame and how we design for the frame. 
because we're moving so quickly, your your the frame is really your impression of the scene. This is the part that we have to get photorealistic. And one of the biggest tools that we have to getting photorealistic visuals is around value. This is also true if you looked at at paintings as well. Um, so much so to the point that we would actually um, do blurred grayscale thumbnails of our scene just to make sure that our values were reading okay and that nothing was standing out. Um, to actually call out this scene in particular, we used to really struggle with this, um, where we would have areas like our guardrail, if I, if I show you over here, or areas like our road lines um, being too white or not, not cohesive. And what that does is contrast draws your eye. And what we found is that people were actually looking at the road lines and looking at the, the guardrails rather than looking at the car. Um, and this created a, a non-cohesive scene and it created sort of a discordance with, um, with the viewer. And so we really want to make sure that we're balancing our values, make sure that they land in a photorealistic frame. How we do that, um, if anyone isn't familiar with this, is with the concept of, of authoring our textures color correct. So what we use, we have this thing called a color checker here. These are industry standard values. Um, and what we'll do is we'll take a picture of something for a texture reference, and then we'll bring it into Photoshop. And what happens when you take a picture of something in the real world is that it's colored by light. Um, you can see that these are two very different scenes. One is in the overcast as one is on a bright sunny day. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to remove all of that light information, all of that color information and get down to what is the base value for that color. And so we'll bring our textures into Photoshop and balance them because Photoshop knows what color this, um, this color checker needs to be. And they'll balance it to get the appropriate values. And this is key for us to get um, good values and good base values at the beginning when we're authoring our textures. Whoops. So we even created the spectrum that shows these are where all the things in life, and this isn't all of them, but it's a handful of common ones that we use in our game, fall on the value spectrum. And what this shows us is a couple of things. One is there tends to be what we call the art direction range. Almost nothing in real life goes above, um, doesn't go to pure white, and never goes to pure black. If something goes to pure black, it's like some weird special material that's designed to absorb all light. But that rarely ever happens in real life. So we never allow things to go over these values. The other thing we found, if you see this red line here, is that most values fall on the darker end of the spectrum. And we actually see this error in, um, in when people paint as well. Um, they tend to author their, their values or their diffuse colors um, too light because they're used to seeing them hit by light. Um, but what happens is you want your diffuse color to be dark to allow your, your light to brighten them up later. Um, and so this is a common mistake that a lot of artists make is um, to author too bright because they're used to seeing values in the sun. So this is something that we control very heavily. This is to show that same image in grayscale to also show how much color can fool your eyes. If you look at those red dots, they look like they should be much brighter because you read red as bright, but their value is actually very dark. And so we do this because we also know that you can't trust your eyes when it comes to value or when it comes to sunlight. So we spend a lot of time with this. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking about it here because it, honestly it is one of the most critical elements of getting a, a photorealistic scene. Um, so we spend a lot of time working on it. This shows the value of that. This is an in-game representation. This is an early shot of our scene. Ignore there's some broken light maps on the road. Um, but if you look at the building, it's showing you that almost none of the values are correct here. The lighting isn't done right. We don't have any bounce light. We don't have good value. Um, the diffuse colors aren't correct. And the net result of that is this doesn't look very believable. It looks very CG. It doesn't look right to your eyes. Once we've done our pass where we get the right color balance, the right color correct, we get the right lighting on the scene, we get the right bounce. This is, these are all the things both in our game and when you're painting or doing anything that add up to being um, a beautifully lit scene that looks um, photorealistic to you. Um, and so we spend a lot of time working on this and this is a really good representation of how much getting those values right matters. Um, just another example, we, so if you look at the images, the two images on the top are photo. Um, the one on the left is actually our old studio. Um, we did this because we really want to spend a lot of time going out and rechecking our values. The image on the bottom is from our game. 
Um, and you can notice a few things that are slightly off, like the trees aren't great and maybe the reflections, but you can see how closely and how much time we spent making sure that our values were as close as possible. Um, and then that translates to the two images on the, on the right. Um, that's Laguna Seca. The image on the top is uh, a photo and the image on the bottom is our game. And we just spend a lot of time, again, really massaging those values and making sure that we get them right to produce a photorealistic scene. And this is just an example of that same scene in Laguna, just with its value. So you can kind of see where we landed with that. So the next thing I want to talk about is palette, um, going, kind of going along in that um, we move in, in a very sequential manner. Um, when it comes to palette, palette was what we used to create our mood. Um, so just a quick anecdote here. We, uh, so we did this, uh, we shot Dubai in the desert um, when it broke the heat record for that area for all time. Um, so while we were out shooting in the sun, it got up to 131 degrees. So uh, all, all of our, we were out there, all of our cameras stopped working right around one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, everything just, just shut down. Um, it was just too hot, including us. Um, so we went back to our car and what we found in our car was that everything that was metal or thin had actually melted. So all the little metal springs, all the coils, all the little metal bits in our camera cases had all melted into these little puddles of liquid metal. So uh, we went home because we're like, all right, that's that's probably too much. And uh, we actually pulled the key cards out of our pockets, which were plastic, and they had all melted too. So we kind of threw them on the desk of the uh, hotel and uh, we're like, wow, how do you guys deal with this? And the hotel owner, he's just like, because no one goes out in the day at this time. Are you guys idiots? So we really, uh, they, we really struggled here. But what we really found was uh, there was a mood and atmosphere to this that we wanted to capture, the sense of heat, the sense of intensity. And the way we wanted to capture that is through this palette. Um, what we really liked was this feeling of this warm orange sand against this super cool blue sky. We felt that was a really great juxtaposition and a great way to show the intensity and the heat. Um, you can kind of almost feel it, right? Um, and so you can see at the bottom, we also have what we call a weighted palette, which is to say, um, the larger blocks are the ones that are going to take up more of the scene, um, that are going to have a greater effect on the scene. And so this is something we really think about when we're trying to establish mood. This is another shot of a real world track and us basically doing the same thing, but really thinking about palette in advance. I'll show you some examples of what the impact that is. Um, this is one of our, our tracks, Catalunya. Uh, and what it is, this is it, just vanilla, right out of the box. And what we wanted was, we wanted Catalonia to have more of a mood, but we weren't sure how. And we actually used palette and shape language, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, to establish that. So um, we talked about what if this had like a real high intensity F1 racetrack mood? Um, and we did this. So through shape language and through color, this is very stark, almost black and white in terms of its, you know, it's, it's very red and white, almost monochrome, um, but it feels very professional, very, very race-like. Um, and then we said, well, what if this was a bit more festive? And we looked at this. And so you can see, and this also, if you look at shape language as well, um, you can see between palette and shape language, if you look at again, how much this palette is having an effect on the mood and the complexion of the scene. Um, and so these are the types of things that we spend a lot of time thinking about. What mood do we want to impart to the player? What impression do we want you to take away? And that really shows you how much palette has an effect on your impression of that scene. I talked about shape language, but that's another thing that we think a lot about. The shape language really helps determine also the mood and the feel. Um, in this case, what we liked was that Dubai is actually located right on the ocean, which not a lot of people know. And um, there's a lot of sailboats and things like that. And we actually thought that motif would be a really cool juxtaposition against sort of the harsh, dry, rock-like atmosphere of the desert. So we created all these really nice sail shapes. These are concepts. And we applied them to all of the objects in the scene. So we carried this through our tents, through our grandstands, this idea of shapes, sails, um, very tent-like structures. And here's an example of those structures juxtapo juxtaposed. These are, this is a concept against the scene. And you can see how much that shape language impacts and plays against, excuse me, against um, how, we, how we compose. Um, so really great uh, values there. And this is a final concept that we did that kind of pulls all those elements together. Here's um, a, a palette that we used for the scene. Here's, you know, kind of pulling that shapes into the, into the buildings, into everything, to just to give you that, that overall feel. So it's something that we think a lot about when we're making our scenes. 
Um, all these things is to say that we're trying to impart a mood and atmosphere. Uh, what's really interesting to me is when this is Prague, this is one of our crown jewel tracks. When we went here, we actually were really uh, at first really attracted to this one image that we had that showed Prague. It was almost grayscale. It showed an Aston Martin. It looked really haunting. Um, but when we got to Prague, this was actually the atmosphere that stood out to us, this kind of golden light, um, these Renaissance colors, um, this mood was with us the entire time we're here. It had this really nice haze and we're like, oh, this is the mood we wanna capture. We just love this feel. And this is often why we send our track leads on reference trips so they can take away this sort of feel, the smell, the mood um, that you really don't get from looking at pictures a lot of the time. And so we make sure that we impart that mood into all of our tracks. Another little interesting uh, anecdote here, this is the Charles Bridge. Um, so we took a laser scanner out onto the Charles Bridge um, and if, you've, if you know what a laser scanner is at the time, it was six feet tall, looks like a giant evil robot. And we put it, we set it up at about 4 a.m. in the middle of this iconic uh, bridge structure. Um, and I don't know if you've ever set a large piece of technology in the middle of an iconic bridge structure at 4 a.m., but it tends to freak everybody out. So while we were in the middle of laser scanning, even though we had permits, um, cops started running at us from both sides of the bridge. Um, and so we were frantically trying to get the, the scan to complete before the cops got to us. And we just, we got the last rotation right before they got to us. And we said, oh, we're sorry, here are our permits. We apologize, we picked up everything, we moved on. Um, but uh, yeah, this was, a, this was a real challenge to shoot. So uh, anyway, referencing for tracks is always entertaining. Um, but these are just, uh, so moving on, these are just other examples of mood and atmosphere for a track. Uh, this here is showing Daytona. Um, this is also a very different mood, hot, white heat, packed people. Um, this is high noon, very intense shadows, so a very different mood. Um, this is the Nürburgring, so sort of haunted, grayscale, um, just very, very different mood in itself. Um, and so these are the things, things we think about when we go to each of our tracks. Um, just showing, and this is uh, concepts that we do afterwards to translate those who didn't go into these mood boards um, to give the player a feel for all the things we talked about. Haze, color palette, um, light temperature, all that, and that's what we use to create our scenes. We use things like fog here and sky. Sky has a huge impact on everything in your scene. You've probably seen that when you paint, when you do anything, so really paying attention to the sky and what kind of mood you want to impart with that is a big deal for us. So I'm moving on to painting with light. I'm gonna take a quick drink though. This is another thing that we do quite a bit of um, is we use light. Uh, not often the light scenario that we have is not meeting our needs or it's not giving us the effect that we want. So we spend some time changing our light, um, using our light. Uh, in this case, this is an early concept that we did. The problem we were having with this tunnel was it was too dark and it was really difficult for you to get a sense of parallax because there was no contrast for you to be moving against. So it felt like you weren't moving very fast. So what we did was what we often tend to do in these situations is we actually started to cut holes in the roof. We started to move the sun direction to get more contrast in the scene, to get more visual interest, to get that sense of parallax. This is us continuing to experiment with that. We still weren't getting what we wanted until we finally landed here, this gave us the right amount of light, it gave us the right amount of visual interest, the right amount of contrast, and gave you that sense of speed. So we'll often do this, we'll either add or remove objects, we'll add tree walls, we'll do things to use light to our advantage to give the effect that we want to give. Moving on, I'll just touch on this real quick. One of the other issues is with scale. Um, what I don't actually have right here, which I apologize for, is an example of bad scale, but this is an example of good scale. What we found early on when we had so few polys to deal with is that we would spend all of our polys on our big objects and ignore our little ones. And what happened was that actually made everything in our scene feel really cartoony, and you also didn't get a sense of speed. Um, when you don't see these small grounded objects that the player is familiar with, then there's no sense of context. There's no feeling for how big a thing is, what its scale is, or how quickly you're moving against it. So we actually had to double down on all these small grounding elements, all these small set pieces. So if we have a building, including the windowsill, if we had um, a race side object, including these like kind of um, 
these booths and these carts because we want to give you a sense of context and why and how big something is. And so we actually double down on these. We actually spend less polys in our large building and our large assets and more polys on these small grounding elements to give you that sense of, of scale and proportion. This is something that we see often that beginning students don't do well. Um, they forget to add these grounding elements and as a result, their scenes feel cartoony because you don't know how large they are. So finally, I want to talk about texture. And again, I saved this one for last because um, while this does add a great deal to your scene, it tends to be the, the area that students and even professionals tend to jump to too quickly. Um, and so texture is obviously important to give you that sense of detail and surface type. What is this thing going to feel like when I touch it? But you don't want to go here too early. Um, so if any, anyone is familiar with photogrammetry, uh, this has been a groundbreaking technique for us and something we leverage heavily now. Um, but this is the where you take a, a series of images with your camera and then you use a program like Agisoft or Reality Capture to assemble those pictures into a 3D model. And so this is an example of a model that we did here. This is a tree using photogrammetry. And um, our artists build almost all their assets with, uh, with this technique at this point. And it's been uh, really awesome for us. This is another example of uh, where we created this rumble strip using photogrammetry. And it just gives you, and see all these storytelling elements, all this, all this really nice texture. This is, these are all the little elements that add up to making something look photorealistic. In this case, we are using a photo. Um, but it's often the details that uh, um, people miss when they're creating those textures is all those little details and, and um, story elements. So now I'm gonna show you uh, all this in practice. Um, these are a few before and afters. This is obviously a before where we forget this all the time as well. And so oftentimes what we'll say is, you know what, the scene is not working. We're not using all the principles, principles that we just talked about. Um, and we have our concept artists actually go in and do paint overs to help guide us. This scene right here is doing everything wrong. Um, we're lacking those elements of scale. Um, it's all one value. We're not painting with light. We're, um, the saturation isn't good. It's um, doing everything that we, we just talked, it's not doing everything that we just talked about. So we say, help us out concept, and they'll create this image. And you can see what a difference this makes um, in terms of value, in terms of visual storytelling, in terms of uh, painting with light. It's doing all those things I talked about, and the difference is stark. And we have to do this all the time because we forget as well. Um, and it's something I often recommend students do is when they get about three quarters of the way through the piece, take it into Photoshop, paint over it. It's really easy to iterate in Photoshop. And we find that it helps break that sort of disconnect that you have in CG. Um, and so we'll do this a lot. This is another example, barring the terrible crowds that are over on the bottom right. Um, again, scene feels, it feels okay, but it feels flat. It doesn't feel dynamic. It doesn't have those elements of storytelling. You can see the reference image down in the left and even the thumbnail read is better than what we have. Um, so we took it in and we said, what can you do concept? And they produce this image. And again, it brings that, those va that value separation. It brings that contrast. They even put in smoke and birds and all these little details that we, we forgot about. So highly recommend doing this and it really helps to illustrate all these points that I've been talking about. So yeah, just talking about the cohesive frame. This is, none of this is new. These are all um, core values that everyone knows about in, um, in art, but we tend to forget. But it is a combination of all these things, line, shape, color, texture, value, form, and space. And it's easy to forget them, but um, it's, they're just as important in CG as they are when you're doing a painting. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is cadence, how you move through the frame. Um, so everything I've talked about now is still frames, but we also want to talk about how we design the experience when you're racing through a track. Early on, we did this poorly. When we designed our racetracks, this is a concept that we did before we did one of our racetracks called Rio. Um, and we, we, we said is we're going to put a, a visual moment, something to blow you away on every single corner of the track. And the problem is, as everyone knows, when you turn everything up to 11, nothing is. And so what we found was that um, the player had no areas of visual rest, they were overwhelmed, and they weren't getting the impact of a lot of the areas that we designed. Um, so this was an important thing for us. This is a track that we designed later. This was uh, Dubai. And what we said was we're going to have four key moments, four areas that we do turn up to 11 and allow mini moments or areas of rest um, in between 
So we like to think about this as a piece of music. You want high points, you want midpoints, you want areas of rest. Um, it's often how you look at a painting. Um, you wanna make sure that not everything is up to 11. Um, and so now we design our tracks and in my opinion, they're much more successful because the key moments that we design have much more impact to the player. We also don't spread our detail over the whole scene um, like peanut butter. This is a mistake that we made early on. What we do is, this is a shot from our game. This is the iconic hotel from Yas Marina. Uh, what we do is we design these areas to have um, the most visual impact. And we actually put about 80% of our art efforts on these areas because we know as you're driving around the track, there's the hotel again, that that is what you're gonna see the majority of the time and that's what's gonna have your visual impression. And we let the other stuff just kind of bleed off into the, into the distance. This is an example from Rio. Uh, this is basically what I was talking about before where if we know that this is on, on at the end of a long straightaway, we built this iconic moment, this, this shot of Sugarloaf Mountain. And we know that we have your attention here. This is a low impact gameplay area. You're going straight, you're going downhill. There's not a lot that you have to do here. And so we often will design our racetracks to build in these straights so that we can focus your attention on these moments so you, so you can appreciate them, so you have the time to appreciate them. And then when you take these high intensity corners, you know, we, we, t we, we just spend less time on them. We, we put our details in and around the corners instead, but really designing this experience, knowing what your player is gonna be doing and putting your detail as appropriate. And this is just, again, talking to, we also do this with our gameplay. Um, we actually design skids, impact moments, things like that, because we know where we're gonna have your attention and where um, we can spend our, our attention to detail. This is uh, an iconic turn at the end of Laguna Seca. Um, and so this is a turn that everybody misses. And we wanted to tell you that story and kind of forecast it for gameplay um, to say, this is a difficult turn and you're probably gonna miss it too. Um, so we do our skids, we do this sort of like dirt runoff to say a lot of action happens here. A lot of people take this turn wrong and we wanna forecast that. And so we tell you this story um, when we're designing our tracks. So again, these are all different examples where we pull some of that visual storytelling into our tracks um, when we're designing that cadence and it just pays off for us in, in a big way. And again, and like I mentioned, we uh, design it like a piece of music. This is a waveform of uh, Beethoven's fifth. Um, so it's just really interesting. It shows you throughout the piece, they have their highs, their lows, they kind of have two big centerpieces and then they have areas of rest. And this is how we want, want to design our experience as you move through it. So the last thing, like I mentioned, um, we're getting uh, low on time here. So I'll move through this pretty quickly. Um, there's a lot of charts in here. So uh, try not to glaze over. I'm gonna move through them pretty quickly. But what this piece is really telling is about, we have to spend a lot of time thinking about performance. So we're not just designing our tracks and designing our visuals in a vacuum. We have to think about GPU and CPU and all the limits that we have. Um, but we actually find it, it sort of enables us in a way. This is the sandbox that we have to play in and we have to be creative within it. Um, so these are just for anyone that's interested. These are the budgets that we have. This is only to show this 2.8 number is how much GPU for our, we have for our tracks. For anyone who's familiar with GPU budgets, that's not a lot of time. Um, so that's just highlighting uh, how little time you have with it. These are, um, these are tools that our artists use to uh, evaluate budgets. Um, this is just a chart showing that uh, anywhere that's over performance turns red and our artists have a nice visualization of the track to say, those are the areas that we have to work on and this is what we're gonna um, uh, bang at to, uh, to improve our performance. And this is a great tool for us. So how do we prioritize their, our, these visual investments? We really have to think about where you are on the track in advance. This is a, um, a photo from Bathurst showing from this area, you can actually see 20 miles out into the distance. So we have to know you're gonna see 20 miles or out. How are we gonna show this? Um, we'll do this with matte paintings, we'll do this with LODs, but we have to plan this out in advance. This is another shot of Prague. So we know uh, we've designed this racetrack. So we know this is an area where we wanna show off the whole city. We know that you're gonna be looking far out into the distance. Um, 
but we want to make sure that uh, we're not that we have the room for this performance. So we designed this so that there's almost no vegetation. There's very little grass. There's not much blocking your view. We're not spending a lot of attention there because we want your focus to be in the distance. We thought a lot about how we were going to LOD the city. We drew a lot of map paintings for this. Um, so this type of thing takes a lot of pre-planning and design in advance. If you don't go in with this sort of pre-planning, you can wind up and really put yourself in really bad spots and have to spend a lot of time redesigning and optimizing. Um, this just shows that we look at these every day and we're trying to turn them green. That's basically all this graph shows. We spend about two years doing this though. So it's part of the challenges of being an artist in the games industry. Um, again, charts of GPU, probably less interesting for the group. Um, debug menus, less interesting and picks. So we'll just skip through all that. These are all tools that we use to evaluate a scene. So uh, some of the pitfalls that we had for, for all of this is we do a lot of this tuning by hand. And so what we're doing moving forward for us, um, you know, in case you guys are interested, is we're looking to automate a lot of this. So instead of the artist hand tuning, we create levers that allow us to do things like turn up scene density, turn down grass, um, to give us more levers to play with and less hand tuning of assets to optimize for performance. Um, this is just showing you some visual examples of how a game um, moves through its development. Um, this is showing Rio early on, doesn't look that great, um, also has a lot of problems with performance. That number in the top right is 8.8 .8 milliseconds, it needs to be down closer to around 5. This is after we spent a great deal amount of time optimizing. You can see we've done a lot of the things that we talked about, um, composition, palette, value, and we got the scene to about 5.8 milliseconds, which um, was able to run just fine. And these are all the different types of things that we did to get there. Um, this is another scene. This is a, a scene that we got back right from our overseas vendors. Um, it had a lot of issues with everything we talked about again, value, scene composition, and our artists come in and they balance it. And so you can see the big, the big difference that we have there. And also optimize it. We went from 6.7 milliseconds to 5.4. Um, so this is, this is what we get back from our artists, and then this is what we have to do to polish internally to, um, to get it to a place where we can ship it. So a big difference there. Uh, and again, this is calling out some of those things um, in specific detail. This is showing, here, let me pause it real quick. This is actually showing a really interesting thing. When we went from five to six, we actually added a number of features like night and wet and a bunch of things that actually ate performance. So what we had to do is we had to draw the same level, prog, with actually less performance than we had. So we had to make it look just as pretty, but we had to find um, clever ways to rebalance our, perform our scene to deal with not having as much performance. Sorry, let me go back. So that might be a case where you say, but but Matt, five looks better. And honestly, for this particular scene, I'm just glad it doesn't look worse. Um, it was really difficult to get down, but we had to do a lot of clever things with composition, removing trees, doing all that. And this is the type of thing that artists do often um, to, uh, to get where we need to go. This next thing, um, and we're almost at the end here, is to show you a time lapse of how we build up a scene over the course of development that I thought you guys would find interesting. So this is gonna show you Dubai and Rio. Yeah, so just to summarize, um, this is really, again, this is doubling down on core art principles. And those are um, composition, adding fidelity and detail where the player's natural eye flow is. Uh, those core principles of value, palette, shape, and composition, don't lose them. We do often in the industry, they're, they're really um, sort of fundamental, but it's amazing how often we forget. 
Um, build your scene from big to small. Don't focus on the fine details too quickly. Um, design the cadence of your experience. Design a rhythm and flow. Don't do, don't edit everything at 11. Um, plan for your pinch points in advance. Really do a lot of work on pre-production. Understand what your scene is going to be before you edit it. Um, daily, check on performance daily in our case. Um, and then give your artists the tools they need to solve those issues. So that's it. Uh, that's everything. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the talk. And I'd like to open it up at this point to uh, Q&A. Thank hey, you. Man. Thank you so much. Man, that's, that's amazing. Even though I've seen and played it, um, just seeing the breakdown is, uh, honestly, it's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So um, there have been some questions uh, during the presentation. I, I kind of collected them up, and I'm not in any particular order. But sure. I'll try and throw some at you now. And, yeah. Uh, um, you know, we'll go from there. So uh, I thought it was a pretty interesting question. Do you hand draw all the concepts? Or are they 100% computer generated? So we have we actually have a, a group of very talented CG art or um, painters that um, they do a lot of hand painting. Um, however, they also do photo bashing. Um, it really depends on. The, the goal of the concept is to get the point across in as little time as possible. So they'll use whatever tools are at their disposal to get there. Um, but they're actually very talented painters and a number of what they do is also um, hand-drawn. Right. Um, another question, how long does it take to do one track? Maybe like, let's let's talk about like an original track for you guys. How, how long would it take? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question because it really depends on where we are in the project. Um, usually the first track that we create, um, the, you know, we'll start, we'll start iterating. Um, a typical development cycle for us is two years and we'll start a track relatively early on, um, maybe six months after pre-production. Um, and it takes us about a year and a half to make that first track. Um, after that, our crown jewels, what we call our, our fictional environments, they'll tend to take maybe less time, a year, maybe even nine months. Um, but fictional tracks just need more time iterating. Um, our real world tracks, when we're first developing them, take about a year, and then we get those down to six, maybe even four months at times. Um, and a, really a lot of that is our artists are getting more familiar with the system, our tools are getting more developed. Um, so it goes from a, a longer time to a shorter time over our development cycle. Um, so I would say on average, it takes about a year to develop a track. Yeah. Just curious too, uh, how, how many, like how do you guys handle the, the art team? Like how many artists? I know you guys also do outsourcing. What, what, what does that kind of look like? Yeah, so we have sort of three categories. Um, we'll have our internal artists, um, and that's a smaller team. Um, we've actually grown over the last few years, but um, that's typically about eight to 10 on, say, the environment team. I'll, I'll use them because it's a, a typical ratio for us. Um, internal artists, um, maybe less, uh, maybe closer to six. Um, and then we'll have um, maybe another 12 to 18 contractors that we also have internally at the studio. Um, at our peak, and then um, we'll outsource to you know three or four different outsource companies, and in that case, we could have hundreds of artists working at it at a given time. So that's that's kind of the breakdown for our environment team, and that kind of scales across all of it. That's our largest team, but it scales across the other teams. Okay, there was a question about how much of a role does three D scanning have in the pipeline. So uh, it's we leverage it heavily. Um, so we do two things. We laser scan, um, which is where you put a, a device down and you scan um, in, th in the 360 degrees. And then you use that laser scan. Um, we actually use it as a base. Um, we'll break it into multiple pieces and we'll send that laser scan to our vendors. And they'll use it as reference um, when they're building out the actual asset. Um, we also heavily leverage photogrammetry. The more we've learned about photogrammetry, the more we use it. Um, and so now a great deal of our environments, are, our, our prop assets are actually built with photogrammetry. Um, so that's not laser scan, but it's, it's photo scanned. Um, and so a, a good deal of our assets are built out that way. Right. Um, <clears throat> kind of a technical question. Uh, how do you handle culling? And how difficult is it to make the collision? 
Yeah, both of those are good questions. Uh, so we use a visibility system for calling that says, um, because we know you we're on a racetrack, we follow a, our, we have a camera follow a spline um, through our racetrack and we basically set a pixel limit. So we say anything that's lower than this threshold, say six pixels or three pixels doesn't get drawn. Um, and so we've, what we found is that we balanced the amount that we feel like we can, um, we can set that number to without objects popping in. Um, and so we drive around the track, the camera sees what it sees, um, and then it automatically calls out any of the objects that it didn't see from that particular area. Um, and sometimes we'll have to go in and say, you know, this object popped in too late or it popped in too early and we'll have to um, hand adjust that. Um, but that's how we call out uh, objects is, is with this camera based system. Okay. And sorry, what was the other question? Uh, well, it just had to do with the collision and culling. Oh, so for a collision, um, so we built, we just build our collision from the visual mesh. So often um, we'll loft out something like a, a, our road and our shoulders and our barriers, and then we'll duplicate that mesh um, and use that mesh as, as our collision plane. Um, have you ever made an underground track? Uh, the b closest we've made is tunnels, um, small tunnels, but we've never made a completely underground track, but uh, we always talk about that. I think underground on the moon and under the ocean come up pretty often, but uh, I feel like that's uh, not likely, not in our future. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, this was interesting. Have you ever thought of using design to make it more challenging, like a giant billboard to distract? Hmm, visual design. We don't usually, um, we spend a lot of time trying to make it easier for the player. Um, so we try to, we focus most of our efforts, I would say in the opposite to say, how can we minimize distraction to make it so that your gameplay experience is as um, uh, focused as possible. So no, I would say that we try to avoid that. Great. Uh, I just saw an interesting question pop up from that. Um, uh, open world design versus linear level design. Any thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, it comes with its own unique challenges and we don't have to, you know, think about the open world too often, um, but we, uh, our, our sister studio Playground has to think about it all the time. Um, so it definitely comes with its own challenges. It has its own visibility system because you can drive anywhere you want in the world. You have to deal with um, your own collision issues. Um, you're not as focused um, in terms of not knowing where the player is gonna be. So it's harder to design moments for. Um, so what you wind up doing is you wind up drawing these iconic or creating these iconic set pieces. So the moments kind of create themselves no matter where you are in the world. Um, so no matter which way you're looking, you're sort of seeing an iconic area. Um, so it's just a very different design challenge. Those guys are really good at it. Um, they do a, a, a great job. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, it's a whole subject in itself, really. We've talked about it quite a bit. Um, and they both create their own pros and cons. Um, let me see. How detailed do you make humans? How many unique models of humans do you make in the game? So that is that is an interesting question. Um, early on, it, the answer was not very. You saw our crowds, they're pretty terrible. Um, but the more we've developed, the more we want to add you know, storytelling elements, um, the more we want to add that context for the player. So recently, we, you know, in seven, we started to introduce characters. Um, we were sort of dipping our toe into it. Um, I think more and more, we're, you know, we hired a, an all new character team. We're starting to focus more on characters, animation, rigging. Um, creating photorealistic assets using photogrammetry. So um, I would say that we're making a much greater investment in character than we ever have. Um, but you haven't seen a lot of that yet in the games that we've created. We've just started tipping our toe into it. Okay, maybe a couple more here. So uh, how do you do the clouds in the sky? Uh, so that's interesting. We, uh, and we're actually thinking about changing that system. But um, what we do is we capture a 360 HDR um, and we capture frames throughout the course of a day. So we'll set up a camera rig that captures in all directions and we'll just take, uh, take um, HDR exposures um, every say five to 10 minutes over the course of an entire day. Um, and then we stitch those together using a, a, a sort of a vector-based system because we don't want to draw frames uh, over the course of a whole day, it'd be too much memory. So we use a system to alert between frames, um, kind of in a, in a vector-driven system. Um, 
and that produces a 24 hour day night cycle. Um, and then we use that as this sort of almost animated video as a backdrop for our environments. We're actually moving to a, or we're trying to move towards, we're still in development, a more dynamic system that, um, that allows three clouds, maybe something more akin to like Red Den Redemption, something like that, but it's sort of early days. So we're not sure um, how we're gonna be doing that yet. Yeah, and a follow-up question to that as you're explaining is how does that impact lighting? Yeah, and that's the trick. So what we do is we're, because we have to, because we have these skies, we're limited in what we can do for lighting. Um, we are sort of married to whatever we captured. Um, and that's why we're looking to, to break away from, the, even though visually the impact is high, it's limiting. Um, and so what we're looking to do is break away and, and explore a more dynamic uh, CG um, centered system that is, uh, allows us to light it and the scene at the same time. Um, but the question is, can we get the same level of visual fidelity and impact with that system is something we're still iterating on. Great. Well, I think that's, um, it's uh, time for us to wrap up. I do want to thank Matt again so much for uh, giving such a, a great presentation. I mean, again, the visuals are, are just stunning and, and hopefully everyone, you, you have a, a much higher appreciation for what <laughs> goes into uh, creating the visuals uh, for this game. So thank you again, Matt. Great job. Yeah. And I'm seeing a lot of thank yous. So I just wanted to say um, you're welcome. It's been my pleasure. I, I really like um, talking to you guys um, or, or showing this to you guys. And uh, yeah, uh, no, I, I really enjoy doing it.